Welcome to Rational Animal. Today we're going to be talking with Pastor Kevin McGinley from Southgate Church in Fort Collins, Colorado about church leadership. Okay, Pastor Kevin, thank you for being on Rational Animal today. Yes, great to be with you, Matt. So today we have Pastor uh Pastor Kevin on, and the reason why I asked him to come on the show is because for a long time, I actually was very disillusioned with church leadership. I had been in some churches that were very uh, manipulative. Um, the leadership was very defensive. The leadership was all over the place. And I had gotten very cynical, actually, about uh, church leadership. And it wasn't until I was in the Loveland, Colorado area, and we got, by God's grace, were able to stumble into Pastor Kevin's church. And... He renewed my, he renewed my, uh, my hope in church leadership. So I, I was just like, look, I would love to hear Pastor Kevin what he thinks about how to be a good church leader. Uh, so if we could begin, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, maybe some of your background, uh, how long you've been in ministry, maybe about your family, whatever yeah. you'd like to share. Well, thanks, Matt. Yeah, I, and appreciate those words of encouragement. It does my heart good to hear that. Um, Cindy and I, my beautiful, faithful, loving wife, and I have been married, uh, just celebrated 41 years of marriage. And uh, we have eight children, four boys, four girls, and uh, five of our eight are adopted. Our first son is adopted domestically. Then we had three by birth. And then uh, we adopted four girls, all from Asian nations. One's from Vietnam. One is from Korea and two from China. So that has been a wonderful, wonderful adventure that the Lord has taken us on. Uh, I was ordained a pastor in 1988, uh, became senior pastor at Southgate Church in 1993. So doing the math, I think I've been the senior pastor there for 29 years. Wow. <laughs> and I tell people all the time, Matt, that uh, I can't believe I get to do what I do. Uh, I just love, love, love being a, a pastor uh, being a shepherd, uh, you know, I'm, I'll be I'll be putting together a message, you know, studying the word and putting together a message, and I'll just stop and I think I'm getting paid to do this. <laughs> it's just like really, this is what I do in my free time, you know. And so it certainly has its challenges, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. But uh, yeah, I find it such a privilege to uh, be a pastor in the body of Christ. That's great. Yeah, and and. Uh... <laughs> A lot of the people even in your church have been there for quite a long time too, right? Quite a long time, yes. Yeah, they really have. Yeah, wonderful, faithful people in our church. Just love them. That's great. So I I wanted to begin, if we could, then, uh, if you could kind of explain some of the underlying principles of church leadership that, that kind of motivate or animate the way you do things. Yeah, I appreciate that. As I think about that, I think about the greatest leader of all time, right? Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, when he talked about leadership, Matt, he, he really emphasized being a servant. You know, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so I want to keep that at the forefront, is that leadership is not about position or prestige or people serving you. We, leadership really exists to serve people. Uh, we exercise our leadership on behalf of people to help them grow and develop. And so as a shepherd in the body of Christ, uh, my, one of my one of underlying principles I want is to develop others, to really equip them for the ministry and the call that God has on their lives. Nothing excites me more than to see people fulfilling their ministry. Uh, and I think about you and Jill when you were at our church and you had just this incredible ministry in the area of apologetics. And uh, remember you guys teach in a Sunday school class and I was in that class and just always so amazed at how God used you and so, so excited to see that happening. So that's what thrills my heart. I also think about our, you know, two great essentials that in any church we don't wanna miss. And that is the great commandment and the great commission. We just, if we're, if we're going to miss anything else, we can't miss those things, loving God and loving people. And so for me, uh, leadership begins with a, a passion for Jesus and uh, growing in that devotion to Christ. Your, it's really your private life. And we see this in the life of Jesus. It was his private life of devotion to God, the Father, that really fueled his public ministry. 
And so if we're going to have any kind of public ministry, we've got, it begins with a passion for Jesus, loving God with everything we are, and then loving people with compassion. And so there's, uh, I think the principles I think about are passion for God, compassion for people, and then being on mission with Jesus, which is the great commission, and that is to make disciples. Do you think some of your principles have changed over the years? Like, did you, when you first started ministry, were, did you have a different mindset about what church leadership should look like? Yeah, you know, um, I think younger days, I probably was more focused on me <laughs> and, uh, you know, being, being in a position of leadership. And I think God has refined me uh, through some fiery things, you know, uh, challenges and that kind of thing to say, hey, it's really not about me. And I think maybe one of the biggest things I've changed is my definition of success. You know, how do you define success? And, and so many of us as pastors, my goodness, our identity and who we are is so tied with the success of the church. Numbers, growth, you know, that kind of thing, comparison with others. And uh, I, I pray that, uh, you know, the grace of God has worked in me over the years so that I, I don't, I find my identity in him and uh, just being at peace with, with uh, doing what he's called me to do. And success is, is making disciples and success is, is making a difference in people's lives. What is it that you see in a person uh, in your congregation that in, that's a strong indicator to you that you know, there's been some success in that discipleship? Man, that, what a great question. Uh, man, how do you measure, you know, spiritual growth and spiritual maturity? Because that's what we want to do in this. We've really made discipleship the core mission of our church. And so we really talk about that, of, of growing from a spiritual infant to a spiritual child, to a young adult, to a spiritual parent, where you're reproducing and multiplying disciples. And so, um, man, we're looking for, uh, are they growing in uh, the Word of God? Uh, the, the grace and knowledge of Jesus, uh, the growing in their prayer life, in the fruit of the spirit, um, their interaction with others, those kinds of things. Are there some, uh, what, like, where would you place things, even things like church participation um, and that kind yeah. of stuff? And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's a, a thing, I think a principle that I've been reading about in, in churches. And uh, because as you know, uh, there's been declining attendance in the church in America. Not every church, but, you know, and certainly COVID hit, has really affected that. And I don't know, uh, most of the churches here in our city, uh, that I'm, and I'm in close relationship with a lot of the pastors here, uh, we have not gotten back to the level of attendance pre-COVID. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but I hear a lot about this is that instead of measuring, again, success in your church by attendance, it should be measured by engagement. And I think that relates to your question is, uh, in, are people engaged? Are they participating in the life of the church, um, both inside the walls of the church and outside as well? That's, that's great, because that's actually was kind of lead into another question I have is, how do you get your church to be engaged? Because uh, this is something that I really appreciated about you and about Southgate is, you know, in many churches, it was like, you know, I'm the pastor or I'm the church leader in this regard or an elder. Like we do the ministry stuff and you guys just kind of you're, you're the congregation, you know, and right. what, was, what I just thought was great is, I mean, you're, you know, at your church, you have homeless ministry, you have, you know, everything, you know, from kids ministry to homeless ministry to discipleship programs. And you have let people, st you know, stand up and participate in that. Uh, really, the question is. Like, how do you get people to be engaged? Um, and again, I just to reiterate, like, I, I really think it being at your church, I really was able to see in practice uh, lots of different people being able to pursue their gifts in the church. Um, and I don't I don't see that everywhere. So I, I would love to see or kind of hear what you think about what it is that you, you know, how you oversee that and what your like how you do that. You know? Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that because it does take some intentionality for sure. And we're, uh, I think, uh, you know, in terms of uh, preaching, preach for life change and uh, being doers of the word and not just hearers only. Uh, 
And when you do that and encourage people to do that, then you really need to provide some on-ramps for them for ministry. You get them all fired up and inspired. Yes, I want to serve. Yes, I want to. And then it's like, okay, now what do I do? And so we're always looking for what we like to call on-ramps for people uh, according to their gifts and uh, their calling, their passion. Uh, and so uh, usually just talking to people about that and saying, oh, man, you would be amazing in our children children's ministry, our worship ministry, that kind of thing. We do uh, like to have some time to see a person for a while and really get to know them and, and, and look you know, at their character and seeing that develop as well as the ministry. Uh, but man, that's one of our things we wanna just release, <laughs> you know, kind of catch and release, uh, fishing for people, see them coming to Christ and then uh, walking in their, their calling and the passion that God has given them. And so, yeah, we just try to uh, give opportunity to do that uh, for the, the different generations. That's what I love about the church, right, Matt, is that the, it's, all, it's intergenerational. And so we wanna see uh, our kids engaged, our youth engaged, our young uh, young adults, and uh, our, our what we call the fourth quarter ministry, uh, old, older saints in the fourth quarter of their lives and say, hey, we want this to be the most productive phase of your life. We don't want you on the sidelines. We want you in the game. Mm, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just remember your acceptance of Jill and I and and I actually want to relate a real quick story just because I think this is really, I, I don't know if you know how much this impressed me, but it impressed me a lot. Like when, um, I, I remember one time going up after a church service and saying, hey, you know, Pastor Kevin, have you read this book? And you're like, no. And I go, oh, have you, have you looked into this at all? And he's like, you're like, no. And there was no sense whatsoever of self-defensiveness, no sense of like, like, putting me down because I look into things that you don't look into and that kind of thing. And I just, I cannot tell you how impressed I was by that. It's a self-confidence. I like, I can't, I'm not sure what the word is there, but like you came across with a self-confidence that is, is very rare. And, and I, I really, really cannot tell you how much I appreciated that. So then there, there were a lot of little stories that I could give like that, where it was, okay, this is, this is a good leader. We're in a very, <laughs> We're in a great church right now, but I and, and I really, but I also just want to say I really enjoyed being in your church. Uh, so I think you're a great leader. So, well, thank um, you. And I'm not sure exactly which book that one. There's lots of books I haven't read, so it could have been. But but I remember one you gave me that was oh, yeah. really life changing for me. I wish I could remember the title of it, but it was to me. Uh, it just really put so many things together in terms of apologetics, because uh, because I was. That's why I was so excited about you and Jill, because that was an area of definite weakness for me as a teacher. But we were we did a, a whole series on apologetic related things. Jill preached part of a message on a Sunday and uh, your ministry and your input just helped that so, so much. So I think that's a good example of the body of Christ working together, mm. you know. The strength that you guys have was an area of weakness for me, but you come came alongside and helped me be stronger in that area. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. And yeah. thanks for letting us participate. That was great. <laughs> it's one of those, Matt, where you you hear you and, and Jill articulate something and it's just so good. And then I get in a conversation with somebody and I thought, what was that that Jill and Matt said? <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Good. Uh, so I guess the next area I was wondering about is maybe some of the things that have been difficult for you in ministry, maybe uh, internal struggle. It could be an external struggle or both. Um, but like, what are some of the things that you've had to work through um, as a church leader uh, to, to overcome it, to become a, a better church leader? I would say by far, Matt, my biggest challenge as a church leader uh, and a leader has been uh, I am wired to be a people pleaser. Uh, and oftentimes, unfortunately, that uh, even goes into the fear of man. And we know that Proverbs says the fear of man is a snare and that we are to fear the Lord. So I've had to, as a people pleaser, that's been my biggest challenge as a leader because you can't please everybody. Uh, you got to make decisions and you know some decisions are going to be liked by people and others disliked. That, that got just like magnified during COVID and the 2020 election. Uh, anything a church leader did 
you had people on, you know, ends of the spectrum. And so I have really prayed and asked God for grace. You know, his power is perfected in our weakness. And so as a people pleaser, I tend not to confront when I need to, uh, when it's really important. Um, and so I've had to really battle that uh, and ask God for the grace and, and kind of ask myself, do I love this person enough to confront them, you know, on a difficult situation? And that helps me. It's a love motivation instead of coming out of defensiveness or, uh, or you know, pride or something like that, or just an attack on that person it is like, uh, man, I, I want to be motivated by love and that. But I think by far that's been my biggest challenge. And, and, not, and as a result, I probably have not held people accountable mm -hmm. as much as they should be. Because sometimes keeping them accountable, you know, entails c confrontation and uh, showing that hard side of love sometimes. Yeah. Have you had to, have you had situations where you've had to do that and it was, and you, you've had maybe negative results and then other times you've had positive results? Is that? Yes. Uh, although I will say, um, <laughs> mostly positive results, you know, and then you're just thinking, well, why didn't I do that a long time ago? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> it wasn't such a big thing, but here's a, here's another, uh, leadership principle that has really, really helped me. And that is this, grace comes with the chair. And what that means is that when God places you in a position of leadership and say your chair is being the pastor, then we can trust him to give the grace for that, what you need for that position. So grace comes with the chair. There's a leadership book uh, by that title and uh, reading that book really, really helped me. And it's, I've, it's, learned me, uh, it's helped me to learn to trust the grace of God in me. And so when, when I sense the grace of God urging me to do something, then when I have acted on that and trusted that, then I see excellent fruit. Uh, when I have digressed from that and allowed man's opinions and all those things to be a greater influence, that's where I have uh, not seen very good results. Hmm. And have there been, I mean, you mentioned maybe a, a, a book or two, but has, have there been other people that you've relied heavily on in terms of drawing strength for the ministry and maybe learning certain things about church leadership, um, people maybe in your community or people that you watch on TV or like yeah. what kind of resources do you draw from? Man, great question. I think very personally, uh, my father-in-law, Mark Dunaway, Cindy's dad, was probably one of the greatest influences in my life. Um, he since got on to be with the Lord, but um, uh, man, what I learned to be, uh, how I learned to be a husband, a father, uh, a, a spiritual leader, I learned so much from him and I'm so thankful for that. And so he was like a, a, a significant, significant Paul in my life, a mentor of me as a young Timothy. Then I'm so glad for a lot of Barnabases in my life, or Barnaby, maybe we would say. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some, uh, I'm part of the Fort Collins Church Network. I've been the president of the network for many, many years. And, and Matt, the relationship with other pastors, un, other senior leaders has been so valuable to me. I know these guys, they know me, we love each other, we pray for each other, we pass the, each other's churches and we're praying for each other. There's unity, there's no competition. And that dynamic, uh, being able to, to call Chris or Travis or Johnny or Jeff or Derry, uh, you know, on the uh, a church issue, and that's, they, they, being a senior pastor, it's a unique world that we live in. <laughs> And so when we talk, we know that world, and that has been, uh, man, I've relied on that a lot. So having a mentor, having peers like that, and then uh, getting uh, to disciple our sons and uh, planting a church with them has been one of the greatest thrills of my life. So I feel like that 
being mentored and being a mentor uh, has really helped me grow as a leader in many, many ways. I think John Maxwell probably, you know, he's a leadership guru in the, in the church and in the, in the world as well, developing the leader within you, develop, developing the leader around you or leaders around you. Both of those books have been very helpful to me. One on preaching that really changed my, my, my preaching is uh, Preaching with Purpose by Jay Adams. And just having a purpose on that and every message and uh, every illustration, every scripture, every every everything goes to that purpose. And so it's it's not, you know, just a message that is all over the place. That's been very helpful, too. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, my son will still bring up divine and the walls and stuff like that because. With oh, your, your illustrations and yeah, I remember divine. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a literal vine that we call. Yes, that's great. Yes. <laughs> um, are there any like spiritual practices that you have in place uh, that you, you do regularly that that sort of prepare your soul for ministry uh, to sustain you in terms of your, you know, day in day out leadership of the church? Yeah, that, yeah, invaluable, irreplaceable. I'm so glad that I was part of uh, Campus Crusade for Christ when I was in college as a young believer. I, I came to Christ and, and, and faith in Christ between my freshman and sophomore years in college. But one thing that uh, Campus Crusade really emphasized was a daily quiet time, a daily time with the Lord. And as a young Christian, I thought, that sounds great to me. And so I've just developed a daily habit of feeding on the Word of God in, in the Word and in prayer. And so uh, that, that's kind of the foundation uh, for me. It's just my time with the Lord. I build into my schedule days of prayer and fasting, uh, times that I can kind of get away and just have a, a day really to uh, seek the Lord and not only talk to Him, but ask Him to talk to me uh, by the Holy Spirit. And, um, and that's been very, very helpful as well. One of the things that I, I've, I've heard um, from church leaders in various you know groups, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox, is getting people <clears throat> or encouraging people to do things like the spiritual disciplines, and in particular, fasting. Mm. Um, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on the benefits that are derived from fasting? Like what, like what do you think that has produced in you? Well, it is a spiritual discipline that Jesus talked about and that it, I think it really helps you to say, I know this is my process because I, I, I fast one day a week. And as I do that, I'm thinking, Lord, I don't want to just go without food today <laughs> you know, because uh, you can get busy. And, and, you know, I want this to be a time of focused prayer and saying, Lord, I hunger for you. I'm hungry for your word. I hunger for the things of the kingdom. Put that hunger in me so that my desire for you, for the things that are eternal, instead of the things that are temporal, the, the world can, man, get its, its clutches in us. So, you know, the lust of the eyes, lust of the, the flesh, the boastful pride of life, all of that that is of the world just clamors for our attention all the time. I think fasting can break that. And I think we, you know, that, that deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after me. I think that's part of denying yourself and saying, Lord, I'm going without food today because I want you more. I want you more than the things of this world. And hopefully we're also more in tune when we're seeking him like that as well. Right. Nice. Yeah. Uh, do you have, um, and I'm sure this is a common thing for church leadership is criticism. Do you have any thoughts on how to handle criticism in a in a productive way or in a way that you you think is pr prudent? Yeah, boy, they, they, that's a big challenge uh, for us as church leaders, isn't it? Um, man, especially a guy like me, as I said, I like to be liked, <laughs> and so uh, criticism is is difficult. And I think you know the key to that is humility is responding in humility to realize, Lord, I'm a, as a disciple, I mean, the definition of a disciple is a learner. And, uh, you know, after getting over the initial, maybe hurt or defensiveness, 
I hope that I can, and I, I, by the grace of God, get to a place where, okay, Lord, what is it that you're saying through this? What can I learn from this? Instead of just reacting and missing that opportunity because you're, uh, you're kind of responding out of hurt and pride, uh, you know, honestly, a lot of the time. Yeah. Have you had an example where someone was, was critical and, and it, it actually, after thinking about it, you're like, oh yeah, they have a point. Maybe I, maybe I should. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, definitely. Try and think of specific times uh, that, but that has, as you say that, that's definitely happened. And it's like, wow, I'm so thankful that that person loved me enough because we all have blind spots, right? And uh, I think we have people in our lives that, uh, you know, when they point out that blind spot, you just, uh, again, getting over the initial defensiveness and pride, you realize, wow, I'm so thankful that that. And when you look at the, the Bible itself, all scripture inspired by God, profitable for teaching, uh, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. You know, the word of God itself uh, reproves us and corrects us. And it's like, yeah, when we read the word, that's what that happens all the time. So if I'm open to the word doing that, I should be open to other people speaking that into my life as well. How, how do you handle the, the, because there are, I'm, I know there are people who are just like, complain about everything. It's, <laughs> it's never a productive criticism. It's just always just, I don't like this. I don't like that. Right. Um, do you have advice or thoughts on how to, how to handle situations like that? One thing that I've definitely learned over the years, Matt, related to that, I think in my younger years, you know, earlier you asked, you know, how has um, leadership changed over the years? Uh, if people complain that maybe we didn't have something in our church, younger days, I was much more quick to go, oh, well, well, well we need to get that for you, you know? Oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll change in order to, uh, to appease you in a sense. And man quickly learned that it doesn't appease, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, and, and if, especially if it's taking you off your core mission. So over the years, uh, as a pastor, I've been able to tell people, Hey, uh, this is who we are and have a, a better sense of who we are. If that's what you're looking for, I can tell you, there are so many wonderful, amazing churches in Fort Collins, and this one would probably fit you better than being here. So instead of just trying to gather, uh, you know, to, to again, please them in order to keep them to stay, I've, I've been just more open-handed with that and more confident in what God has called us to do and uh, able to articulate that and say, hey, this is the direction God has given us. This is the, the, the culture that we have here. And that might not fit you. That might not fit you. Uh, but I do want you to get plugged in somewhere else. Right. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess this kind of goes along with that. But how, how do you pick your battles? Because I, I would assume that you, if you tried to, you know, deal with every single issue, <laughs> yes. uh, you'd probably drive you crazy, I would think. So is there is there some kind of principle or is it just more of a prudential issue where you just you just have come to know? and have insight into when address take picking this battle will be better or more productive than others. Right, right, right. Great question, Matt. Um, I think kind of an overlaying principle for that for me has been, does this issue impact negatively or positively our church as a whole, that as a shepherd, that I'm called to keep watch over the flock and tend the flock and feed the the sheep. Is this an issue that is significant enough that it's going to uh, have an adverse impact on the flock? And then it's like, okay, I've got the motivation then to address it and and do what needs to be done. Uh, If it's more of a personal thing that I can just give to the Lord and say, Hey, uh, Lord, that's your battle fight it for me, you know, that kind of thing, then uh, I'm able more to just offload that. Uh, and then there are things that I know, again, I think uh, that we're called to as a church. 
uh, that that help filter that. You know, is that something that God is that issue something that God is really calling us to as a church? Um, because I'm very thankful the whole body of Christ, different churches, different individuals, as you know, have different areas of passion and that kind of thing. I think about that, you know, in the political realm. Um, very thankful that uh, there are Christians who are very active in that realm. I think it's very important. I'm not particularly wired that way. Our church hasn't been, uh, you know, at the forefront of that. And so that's uh, sometimes when it, the political battles kind of surface, those are, again, needing to take it to the Lord and really pray about it, um, especially because there's moral issues that are very important that are wrapped up in that whole realm, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's like, is that a, is that a kingdom thing? Is that a, a important kingdom thing that God wants us to address? Yeah, that seems to be kind of a theme too throughout this talk here is too, is you, you have a sense of who you are and what yeah. your congregation and what your church is about. Like mm -hmm. you're not wishy-washy about that. Like you're like, this is what we're about. Um, yes. How, yes. I mean, how long did that take to develop? Would you say, I mean, that, that sort of resolve and long time. <laughs> long time uh, recognizing again, man, uh, I think there's two aspects to it. recognize you can't please everyone and that there are the reason we have the body of Christ at a whole. We are a local church, a local expression. Uh, and But I'm so thankful again in relationship with all these other pastors and the wonderful churches they lead, you realize, hey, the kingdom work is going to get done. We don't have to do all of it. We can, we can stay in our lane in a sense that the Holy Spirit has guided and directed us to be in. And actually, and I'm sorry, it's my, if my questions are a little disjointed, but you bring something up and I'm always like, oh, I really want to oh, ask sure. you about that. So, yeah, yeah. So one of the things, like our, our current pastor here, we're going to a really good Anglican church. Um, it, I think when he first started, he really tried to reach out to different pastors in the area. And I think maybe one responded to, to, the, to his request. And in the southeast there were a lot of churches <laughs> so it's not like um and th that i saw that out in colorado is the 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 relationship in the between the pastors seemed to be like tight like there seemed to be a real relationship a real collaboration between yes. churches a yes. lack of competitiveness between churches uh that t took me back because in the southeast that's very hard to find um uh -huh. Uh -huh. what do you have thoughts recommendations on how pastors can foster those kinds of relationships, um, maybe what kind of hurdles that they might see in doing that and how to overcome maybe some of those hurdles? Yeah, yeah, you know, in the Fort Collins Church Network, we, we call, uh, we have a, a acronym or whatever, it's called RPI, Relationships, Prayer and Impact. And so that's where we've stayed is that we're building relationships, pastor to pastor, and I think if those don't exist, that's going to take some bridge building and one-on-one -on -one kind of meetings, you know, to build that kind of thing and maybe start with a core of guys that have relationship and have a vision to bring other pastors into that. Then when we get together, the emphasis is, hey, we're going to pray for each other and we're going to pray for our city because God has placed us in this city together for I is for impact. Uh, we can impact this city in a greater way if we're kingdom minded instead of territorial, if we're kingdom minded instead of just our local church, obviously that's really important to us as pastors. But if we're kingdom minded, uh, then a gain that another church has, man, we celebrate that just as much as they do because it's a gain for the kingdom, you know, instead of jealousy or, oh man, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, we genuinely then can rejoice in each other's successes and walk through others' hurts and challenges and difficulties that we face as pastors. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I know I know we're running short on time, so I got two more questions if you have time. Sure. Okay, so this one was in on the this this is a little different. Uh as a pastor, you're actually in uh, very good shape, like physically. And this is one of the things I used to, you know, joke around with Jill about. I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty sure if ninjas stormed the pulpit, Pastor would be ready and like be able to, <laughs> to, to, to handle himself. <laughs> uh, how, how important do you think that is for, 
for leadership and just maintaining that sort of vibrancy and energy, like just keeping physically fit. You know, it's really neat that you bring that up, Matt. Uh, And I think that was because because that was one of the things I was even thinking about that wasn't necessarily on our original list of questions Mm -hmm. that is so important is to maintain that uh, being physically fit. And it, it helps you mentally, it helps you emotionally, um, you know, all of those kinds of things. And so uh, I think it's, it's extremely important uh, for church leaders uh, to really take care of themselves physically uh, because there's such a, a wear and tear on you mentally and emotionally oftentimes. And if you are sleep deprived, if you aren't in good shape, if you're not eating well, that's really going to have a negative impact on your outlook, your motivation, your attitude, all those kinds of things. So I've just been, uh, that's a big part of what I do every day is finding the time to work out, you know, and stay, stay in shape. Yeah, that's great. I, I mean, as a member of the congregation, I know people might not like to say it might not even be politically correct or whatever, but there is a respect that comes with somebody who cares for their body mm-hmm. like and, and takes care of it so that's and shows a kind of discipline that you don't that, it's great so yeah thank you and mm-hmm. then i guess the last question is uh you know what do you what advice do you have for young church leaders who are just starting out um what kind of pitfalls do you think they are more prone to fall into how do you avoid that like, yeah yeah good great question um get a mentor You know, really find somebody who can be a father in the faith to you uh, that you can go to that has wisdom and experience beyond your years and uh, sit at their feet and drink it in, you know, uh, and just be a voracious learner as a disciple. I think another thing is that uh, don't seek a position or platform. Uh, Seek a uh, humble servant uh, posture uh, and seeking just to serve people. Uh, oftentimes, that young leader with a lot of vision and, and zeal, which is awesome, uh, but a lot of times they, we, and I say this is speaking as a younger pastor, is you know seeking that that worldly success, seeking that uh, uh, notoriety that comes from having a position. That is just so antithetical to the kingdom. Uh, and, and the kingdom is like you descend into greatness, as Bill Heibel says, is maintain humility, serve others. I would say abide in Jesus and abide in the word. Don't press, don't uh, try to operate outside of the grace and gifting that God has given you. And then I would say, hey, make sure you're keeping the main thing the main thing. And that is going back to what we talked about before the great commandment, loving God and loving people and the great commission, make disciples, have that be your core mission. Cause that's the mission that Jesus gave to us. Uh, stay evangelistically fiery. Uh, you know, if you're going to have an evangelistic church, you got to be evangelistic, uh, personally and, uh, don't, don't allow your church to get internally focused. We got to be externally focused and we got to be intentional about that. It's a battle all the time. And as we uh, make uh, discipleship the core mission of our church, we're starting a lot of small groups to really help help that. And I keep I keep telling our leadership team is like, hey, uh, we could have I love small groups. They're, they're awesome. But small groups tend to become ingrown because the relationships grow deeper. And uh, I say we've got to have an element in every one of our small groups where we are not in ingrown that we are external and we're encouraging everybody to have a prayer, care, share lifestyle. Pray for the lost, care for them, show them the compassion and love of Jesus in practical ways, and then look for opportunities to share the gospel. Great. Pastor Kevin, thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Good to be with you.